All right, what is up? Welcome back to another amazing episode of How to Invest in Commercial Real Estate. Yeah, what's up, guys? Excited today. Brian's, you know, hanging in there as usual. I'm hanging in there. Just always so tired all the time, Brian. God. Yeah, I know it. <laughs> well, uh, Labor Day weekend. We just got back from uh, touring Amarillo. Exciting Amarillo, Texas. Yeah, so that's a good example of, of deals that we had uh, modeled that modeled really well. Uh, kind of making some assumptions and we get out there and we just, we weren't really thrilled with the real estate as it sat. And so sometimes you take a trip and you just don't get a feel for the area or feel for the center until you're walking it. And um, I think one of those centers may still be in play if we can lease enough of the vacant space before we get through our DD. But overall, you know, just did, did, wasn't thrilling in its current condition. Yeah. What's interesting on the one that we looked at, if you just looked at some pictures of the front, it looks great, right? The red brick, it's, it's fairly new construction. But then you walk around the corner to what it's attached to, and it's, there's a, what, 37,000 square foot building that's vacant. Vacant. Yeah. So I was, you, I was telling my son that you, the other day. You can't always just judge the front. Sometimes you got to walk around in the back. You yeah, know? that's right. That's, well, that so. That's funny. Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> real, great things to tell your seven-year-old. Seven yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. They, they were both fairly vacant deals. Like, I think in, in the two centers, we knew of three tenants that were there. So we knew it was going to be a massive lift, but it was just heavier lift than we thought, I think. Yeah, and, and my takeaway, uh, and this may be helpful for people in, in, you know, listening to the podcast, you're going to get a vacant center, fine. Uh, when you lease it up, you have to make some leasing assumptions. Let's say I'm going to lease this up, and I'm going to get 12 bucks a foot in rent conservatively. And I'm going to lease it up to 90% within six months. Okay, great. Now, uh, what I want you to do is back calculate what cap rate did you effectively purchase it at if you're able to get those rents uh, and you're able to stabilize up to 90% occupancy. And uh, we were discussing this while we were down there. You know, we can buy non-cap deals on the market right now uh, that are fully occupied in, in a pretty good area. So when I lease up that space, I need to be way higher than that cap rate. Uh, baked in because I'm, I'm assuming so much risk and there's so many assumptions because I may not lease it at 12 bucks a foot. I may not mm -hmm. lease it up to 90% occupied and it may, it may take me longer than six months. I may have to put in more TI than I thought. All of those factors. So if everything goes perfect, I need to be at a 12 cap, 13 cap uh, on, on going in numbers because of how much risk and how many assumptions have to go right for me to get there. So if they all don't go right, maybe worst case you end up an 11 out of 10. But if you're, if you're worst case, you're at eight or nine, well, you can buy an eight or nine right now with no risk. Mm -hmm. Or not no risk, but uh, not the lease-up risk yeah. that you have with a vacant building. Uh, you have, obviously, you have risk that tenants might move out. So that was kind of the exercise that we were trying to go through when we were down in Amarillo on these vacant deals. Yeah, and it's honestly just one of the challenges to, to using a single return metric. You know, you've got to be able to get comfortable with a model that gives you several, several different viewpoints of the deal because at the end of the day, a... a a cap rate, especially going in cap rate of, of the, it's like, you know, I, I forget how many square feet. I think it was like 20 or 30,000 square feet with three tenants in there. So mm -hmm. it's not the easiest to evaluate without a ton of assumptions, very similar to a development deal. Uh, it, you know, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, this, is like, this is more like a development deal to me. We've got a lot of work to do. We've got some risk, but we've it, got a good price on it. Yeah, it's a development deal and you're starting with the building. Yeah. You're just starting with yeah. the vacant building. Yeah. Uh, surprisingly though, like the centers across the street were full of tenants, full of cars. Uh, Martindale looked great. That was the first time I had gotten eyes on Martindale. I know we had gone down there before during DD, but, um, I was surprised with that. I, I thought we were going to have to do way more to that, um, than I think we're going to just based on, on some of the feedback we had, um, on the site. And then the other thing is, is that deal has got. Way more cash. I mean, it's it's got a lot of cash. I can't. What else did you think needed to be done? Because we got a lot of work to be done. Yeah, I mean, I think I think new roof, new roof. Uh, yeah. I think we're we're gonna there's paint water, the exteriors. There's, there's water damage inside. Uh, yeah, and we're gonna need to do something with the parking lot. Maybe we can, you know. Yeah, maybe you thought sweep it, seal it, stripe it, yeah. and get get by. Uh, we're gonna redo the pylon sign. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so there's a lot to do at Martindale, but we do have the money set aside to yep. do that work. Yep. Well, so today's topic, uh, you know, we're into September now, the, and, and we think that this month is going to be the first rate cut by the feds. 
So we see uh, a changing market in commercial real estate over the next 18 to 24 months. And so this podcast is just specifically talking about how do we prepare for this market shift? How do we take advantage of it to the best of our ability and, and hopefully help you guys do that as well? Yeah, in my view, we've been preparing for it for the last, I don't know, 12 to 18 months, right? We anticipated that there might be some rate cuts. We got pretty aggressive on, on buying. We didn't really bake those rate cuts in. We found good properties that, that cash flowed, but now we're going to be able to take advantage of the, of the lowering interest rates. Yeah, I would say maybe we've been on it for eight months, six, eight months. Yeah. I mean, really towards the end of 2023, beginning of 2024, we, we started to switch strategy as cap rates had finally started to move up because, you know, sellers are kind of getting desperate over the time. And yeah. and, and we knew that uh, that we, we didn't know. We thought there was going to be uh, no more rate increases. Mm -hmm. If we can get a property that's, that's stabilized today, that cash flows today, then you get upside as the rates come down, as long as you're able to refinance. If you get a 10-year CMBS debt, 10-year life debt, you're not going to be able to do that. Uh, but if you, you can get floating debt uh, or you can get bank debt that you can pay off with no penalty, then it allows you to, to take advantage of the, the rate decreases. Yeah, and, and sometimes you don't even have to refinance, right? Because the, the value of these properties is predicated on the cash flow that the buyer is, is going to receive. So if their debt is cheaper and they're getting more cash flow, they can afford to pay you more for the property. So in, in some instances, it just means that an asset that you've been wanting to sell for a while, but hey, you know, I, I know debt is super expensive. I know I'm not going to get an amazing competitive buyer in this economy. Now that rates are starting to tick down and there's a larger pool of buyers that can now get cheaper, you know, more competitive debt, that's going to drive the value of your property up and, and maybe make some, um, you know, people who would have been sellers now sellers, um, yes. I, I think. So uh, interesting that you say that. So, you know, what we saw was that it took a while for, sellers to uh, lower their prices, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and then we saw that shift. They did lower their prices and we started buying. So now is there going to be another wave? Are, are sellers going to uh, increase their prices because of the lowering interest rate? That's a touchy one. You know, um, I think you'll see a lot taken off the market for a period of time and then it'll magically come back on the market uh, with a <laughs> higher price. Oh. If, uh, if, go ahead. If, you know, it, it does. They, they may just, you know, keep the face value of the price and have it move because there's been a massive stagnant set of deals all year. All year, you can see the deals that have been sitting there all year and haven't moved their price point from the, you know, unrealistic expectations they had back in February. So, I don't know. They could go either way. The answer is yes. Some of the sellers are going to try to increase their prices as rates come down. But that's not going to be everybody. And it, the, the uh, price is being increased by sellers is going to lag the interest rate decreases, just like the prices decreasing lagged the yep. uh, rate increases. And so it's not like everybody at one time just decides to do a thing. There's people that have property on the market right now that need to sell. Yeah. And so they're not going to adjust their pricing at all because they're already having a hard time uh, selling their property. It's taking a while, whatever. And, and so this, this rate cut is only going to help maybe get an offer in the range they want it. Uh, so I think it's just, a, it's going to be a mixed bag. And like we always tell you, it's not a perfect market. So there's going to be a bunch of sellers out there that are asking uh, higher prices and lower cap rates. And uh, that, that doesn't need to be, you don't need to be the buyer for those deals. What we're, we're looking for is the same thing we have been looking for is we're going to try to pick up good assets in good locations at uh, above eight and a half cap, uh, pre preferably nine, even nine and a half cap. And we're going to try to put uh, debt at, at six and a half, uh, you know, to seven on it today and hope that the rate uh, drives both the five and 10 year treasury down and also prime rates down. So I also think it's a big misconception that, you know, let's say Powell gets on the TV and, and drops the rate, right? You're not just calling your local neighborhood bank and, and saying, hey, you know that loan you quoted me a week ago? It's it's quarter point yeah, cheaper now, yeah, right? right? He's he's going to laugh you off the phone. It's, it's probably not. You know, yeah. you're probably on some index that is is responding either now and has affected already. I don't know what the, the treasuries have done the past week. I, I think Powell's meeting is next week. Jobs report so. comes out this week. So I mean, treasuries are down. I looked at them today. Treasury, 10-year treasuries below 3.8. Um, five-year treasuries below three, seven, I think, 
Um, and so that that's that's really good. But like you say, the the rates will come down if you're on Prime Plus, Prime Minus. Right. Prime right. is going to come down. Right. Okay. We don't. You know, the other indexes are not going to come down by a fixed half a point. They're market driven uh, and demand driven. So uh, it just depends on the index you have. But generally, as Prime comes down. Uh, generally, other indexes and rates tend to follow somewhat, uh, but rate, uh, Prime is what uh, five and a half or eight and a half for the consumer. Yep. So it's going to go from eight and a half to maybe eight. That's right. That's not great. It helps you on your revolving debt, helps you on your credit card debt, helps you on your development deals. Uh, but all of the deals that we're purchasing, uh, like shopping centers, we're getting different rates than that. Typically, a, a spread like a two eighty five over the five year. So uh, today, that's like six and a half. Um, and so those rates are the ones we're going to be looking at, but we still believe those are going to be coming down. Uh, so we're, we're excited to try to force acquisitions over the next six to 12 months. Uh, obviously we're going to keep acquiring after that, but we're going to try to be focused on higher cap rate deals over the next six, 12 months in order to take advantage of these lower rates. What are, um, long-term Fannie Freddie rates right now? Do you know? Man, that's on, a good question. Side? I, I do not know. Um, uh, I think last time I, I looked into it, it was low sixes still. Uh, but, but but could be getting better now, uh, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. We need to have a lender on because I, I, I do want to have uh, what we'll call an expert on the different indexes and the and different rates and how uh, local banks are going to be adjusting their lending. Because obviously we've talked about Prime, but a lot of the times they don't lend on Prime. So they'll lend on something else. So let's get a lender in front of our audience describing what their viewpoint is of what the five and 10 year are going to do, what other indexes can our investors uh, get loans against, and, and just kind of giving options and education on on the whole rate landscape since it's going to be affecting the market. That's a good idea. We ought to do that next week or week after that maybe. Yeah. Let's do. Yeah, I think that's another massive misconception is banks' cost of capital. You know, it's not necessarily prime. They, they could have cash, they could have a significantly lower cost of, of capital. So when, when you're looking at a bank that could potentially have an insanely low cost of capital in a high interest rate environment like now, they could be killing it. They're probably killing it. Well, I know that the, uh, the lenders we've talked to, it, it's been a little bit of a struggle with their cost of capital and they've been making less money because they're paying more out to the depositor. Uh, and so okay. that's, uh, so what these rate drops will do is it will effectively reduce the amount banks have to pay their depositors and it'll reduce their cost of capital and it'll allow them to be a little more aggressive on the lending side. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we were talking about this before the show, uh, you know, last week I spent, uh, time on, on two or three different sites, Crexy, Real Insight Marketplace, and a few others just downloading any OM that I thought. Uh, was good real estate between you know two and fifteen million, mm -hmm. and uh, that are that the asking cap rate was seven seven five eight or better or higher, and and we're going to be trying to lob offers on a bunch of these properties, just seeing if we get any sellers that play ball that so we can close before the end of the year. Mm -hmm. I mean, closing before the end of the year is going to do a lot of things. It's, you're going to get depreciation for the full year, but you're also going to going to take advantage of the pricing market that we have today. You know before all these rate hikes start affecting the overall uh, market prices of, of assets. So seems like a good strategy to me. Yeah. I mean, I think just generally there's still a lot of great discount real estate out there and there's not a lot of people that are getting deals done, which is interesting. I, I, I see next year being a lot more competitive, a lot, a lot busier. Um, which is, is good and bad for us. You know, it's, it's been challenging to get deals done, but we've, we've been able to do it at our pace, you know, instead of a seller's market where you're competing and doing best and final or assets are unpriced timelines are insanely tight. You know, you're getting three or four weeks of DD. You're not getting any extensions. You're closing in three or four weeks after that. There's no sympathy. They're trying to take your earnest money. So it's, it's been, it's been interesting going through this, at least for me, because just a lot of this real estate, I, I haven't seen this cheap, at least the the face value of the coupon, you know, the, the cap rate, you haven't seen a lot of, you know, eight, seven, five, nine cap plus 
like hundred percent occupied real estate. We've that, been that's decent that has decent tenants that you want to own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've we've been doing, you know, developments where our unleveraged return on costs is is seven, seven, five, eight, you know, super not speculative, but there's a lot of risk to take a piece of dirt to a, 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 a nice piece of cash flow that you can sell in the marketplace. So from my perspective, going in and, and like our fluorescent deal, I felt like we have great pricing on that. It's almost nine cap real estate. It's shadow anchored by a target. It's 100% occupied. We've got great weighted average lease term. We've got amazing credit performing tenants, tenants yep. credit tenants. And so, um, yeah, buying that at a nine cap. Uh, it wouldn't have happened two no, years ago. Uh, yeah, two years ago, that would have been a, could have been a seven and a half cap deal. So, yeah, I think I think that's the opportunity, right? And we we wouldn't have to refinance out of that. And we don't need it to be a seven and a half cap deal uh, <laughs> at all when we yeah. sell. So I think we haven't baked in a lot of these assumptions. We're just saying, hey, if if we don't get you know insane amounts of cap rate compression, if we don't if we don't get a refi at all, and we still have a good deal, we know the probability of getting cap rate compression is there. We know the probability of getting um, uh, refinance savings is there or just the the rate being cheaper driving the property value up like we're saying so there's lots of opportunities that had massive home run out of the park here and your downside is i've i've just got stable cash flow yeah yeah, yeah. debt didn't get as cheap as i thought that's fine i didn't need it to um yeah so can we can we translate that to our investor base where they're as interested and excited about getting in on these deals given the timing of the market shift yeah because you know, you may have to take a deal that's got slightly less cash flow than you would like, but you're getting it at a good price. And the only reason it doesn't cash flow like you want it to is because the rate is a little higher mm -hmm. and you're just set up for, for attaining those returns. Can the investors, can they see it? Do they, do they believe it? Uh, do they like that strategy? And that's what we have to do a, a good job of is convincing them that it's solid real estate and it's a solid price. And there's some real upside baked in as this market shifts. Yeah. So in the same vein, uh, would we be more willing to take a floating rate loan right now? Would we take that chance? I, I would. We just got a floating rate on Little York. Yeah, I know we did. Arvest Bank. Yeah, uh, you know, there were, I, I could have gotten floating rates back when, you know, back when, in when rates were 4%. Yeah. But my thought was, why? Yeah, yeah. It's so that's low. not the time to get a floating rate. That's why. <laughs> yeah. It's not. But is it now? Um, I, when you've I, got... Powell saying rate cuts are coming, you know, I feel, I feel like it. Yeah. yeah. When you've got an election year, I, I feel like that's going to kind of prop it up a little bit, you know, but everyone wants the economy to do good right now. Um, and, and for the next 12 months, everyone, no matter what. Yeah. So I feel like a lot of things are, are pushing in the direction, um, to where it's not, I, I don't, I don't see it getting unnecessarily more expensive. I, I think floating rates are inherently more volatile. So depending on what index you're getting your spread on, yeah, you could have a little, it's not always going to be going down. I would say over the next 12 months, it's going to be trending down. Right. Yeah, I, I feel like that's the fairly safe assumption. Yeah, the bet you're making is that rates are going to be the same or lower two years from now. Yes. And so uh, they might not be. Okay, but but you're making a bet, an educated bet that that Powell's already said the, that he's going to lower, or we think they're going to uh, cut the rates in September. Uh, and the economy is kind of at an all time high here, and so if we have any type of correction, uh, rates like the ten year and the five year, they're going to go down. Uh, and the reason is because you know when the market goes down, demand for safety, which is treasuries, goes up. Yeah. The more people are willing to pay, the more the less they have to yield. Yeah. So it's an inverse relationship to demand there, but. Uh, but yeah, I think I think it's worth the risk right now. If you said I'm going to get a floating rate, as long as you have the ability to fix it or ability to refinance it without penalty, yeah, then yeah, take your risk. I I think you're even if the rates stay the same, you didn't lose anything. But I think there's a good chance they'll be lower six months, twelve months, eighteen months from now. Yep. So, okay. all right, uh, you know, I, I hope you appreciated the the discussion on the shifting market that we're going to have over the next 12 to 18 months. Hopefully you're in the market and you're going to try to take advantage of it by acquiring some good assets. Uh, but if you're not and you want to invest with us, let's go. Yep. I would also say, uh, you know, this is a big reminder. It's the end of year push, right? So like a normal time horizon on a deal from the first time you look at it to the day you close is probably 90 to 100 days. I, very close. We're right there to the end of the year. So like, like Joel said, you can close on something the last day of the year 
and get depreciation for that entire year. Um, if you cost segregate it, you can really get a lot of depreciation. So if you're looking at end of year tax savings, uh, now's your time. If you want to get a deal closed before the end of the year, now is your time. Yeah, you got to be making offers right now and getting under contract. So. Yep. All right. Well, we'll see you guys next week. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. guys.